Um, so my earliest, like my first initial thoughts, um, these have always kind of been my thoughts when looking into Lysenko just on a, on a base level. Like capitalism is such a fetter on science. Capitalism is such a fetter on science. The bourgeois, you know, economic and um, the econ bourgeois economic system and the superstructure, the, you know, culture and academy and politics that stems from it really, really hold back scientific progress, scientific discussion and debate. Um, hold back the um, pursuing and research into new ideas that may challenge, you know, pro-capitalist ideas or ideas that are accepted in the West or ideas like Lysenko's that have, you know, been dismissed by Western biologists um, that originated in the Soviet Union. Um, and we had a tweet about this the other day um, that I thought was pretty good, or Carlos did said under capitalism, this is William Z. Foster, by the way, under capitalism, science is a slave to the class interests of the bourgeoisie. Thus, biology justifies the mad class struggle in war. Economics puts on an unqualified blessing upon wage slavery. History proves that capitalism is society perfected. Psychology explains away poverty on the basis of inferior beings, etc. Capitalist science is also a veritable fortress of metaphysical concepts of every kind. But socialism strikes all these fetters from science. The working class exploits no subject class. Therefore, it has no interest to degrade science into a subtle system of propaganda. But on the contrary, to give it the freest possible development, Marxian dialectical materialism destroys the metaphysics that paralyzes bourgeois science. William Z. Foster in, in Towards the Soviet America. Um, so the class interests of the bourgeoisie often lead them to suppress scientific advancement. Um, and scientific investigation. And, and as I was researching genetics um, and, and, you know, the evolution of uh, genetic and biological sciences, I found that it's the opposite of what you usually hear in the West. You know, there were far more British and American and Australian geneticists and scientists who were suppressed or were, who, or were killed or were silenced um, than there were in the Soviet Union. You know, where you had these different schools of thought in genetics who were constantly debating these things um, and, and constantly presenting new research to the public, which would be published, you know, so people could read it and, and make a decision for themselves. Um, so for a great example of, you know, bourgeois science, just look at the Wikipedia page about Lysenkoism. Right. And this is why I knew I needed to eventually do my own research on Lysenko, because um, this is his uh, Wikipedia page is so ridiculous. Dismisses him as a pseudoscience, says more than 3000 mainstream biologists were dismissed and imprisoned in the Soviet Union. They were executed. You know, anybody who went against Lysenko was suppressed and killed, even though, you know, there were open opponents of Lysenko. Um, well before he he stepped up on the stage and after, you know, and these ideas were debated all the way through. Um, and there were, you know, there were tons of geneticists being suppressed in, in the UK and elsewhere. Um, after World War One, I, I believe, for World War Two, there weren't any like um, geneticists left in the UK um, doing doing more research. And there was no money and um, resources even being invested in that research anymore. Um, but yeah, just dismisses him as ridiculous, says he supported Joseph Stalin. Um, they were best buddies. Um, and there's one part, I don't know if you keep reading this, basically what they say is that Lysenko was wrong because he tried to fit genetics, um, and genetic science and evolutionary science, evolutionary biology, studying how species evolve and change into dialectical materialism, the dogma of dialectical materialism, right? So we read Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism and then just tried to fit genetic science into this little box. Um, and, and that's why he was wrong. And after hearing that, you know, a red flag should go up for anybody who understands what dialectical materialism is. Right. Anybody who knows what it is 
should be like, well, that doesn't really make sense because dialectical materialism isn't a dogma, right? It's, it's not a dogma at all. So, you know, if dialectical materialism were being adhered to and Lysenko was wrong about something, dialectical materialism says that it should be investigated, right? And that whatever he's wrong about should be criticized um, and all these theories should be publicly debated. Right. There is no dogma of dialectical materialism for him to fit genetic science into. Um, you know, it's dialectical materialism itself is a scientific theory of the development of uh, human societies. Which is what British Indian geneticist J.B.S. Haldane points out in this. You know, he doesn't say too much about in defense of Lysenko in this. Um, but he says that the Western accusations against Lysenko don't make any sense, right? Because dialectical materialism states if Lysenko was wrong, what he was wrong about should have been called out and debated and discussed. And then they should have, you know, pursued more research to find what the truth actually is. That's dialectical materialism. You know, so a lot of the Western claims about Lysenko that are just used to di or Lysenkoism that are just used to dismiss it on its face um, uh, don't make any sense in themselves, which is, you know, Carlos talks about this with his analysis of the purity fetish. This is what Western academia always does with the Soviets, right? They don't engage with the scholarship. They don't engage with the substance. They say the Soviet Union killed 800 million people, including all geneticists. Um, and Lysenko went along with it. And that's why we should just ignore everything that ever came out of the Soviet Union. Um, and they just weren't as smart as us, you know. Um, so they, they fell into all these silly, silly ideas. <clears throat> when in fact, you know, the Western claim that they're using to dismiss Lysenko doesn't make any sense. Um, so Haldane points that out as well as pointing out, you know, the mass censorship um, that was going on in the West, in the UK, in Australia, in, um, in the US, <clears throat> of geneticists and the suppression of the debate. And he fleshes out what the debate was within the Soviet Union, which was extremely rich. And you had all these different schools of thought, you know, and these schools of thought that, that took into account, you know, what had already been established by Western scientists and Western geneticists. Um, where, you know, that science was being politically suppressed and stopped from evolving. Um, but in the Soviet Union, they were, you know, questioning, you know, whether the, the um, conclusions of Western geneticists were correct, you know, taking what they thought was correct and trying to expand on it. Um, and not only that, but of course, the Soviet Union was feeding and educating and training up all these new people, all these peasants and workers who previously had no access to education or, you know, had no option of becoming scientists. Um, so it would eventually lead to a, a flourishing uh, of knowledge is what Haldane argues in this. Um, he ended up not supporting the Soviet Union anymore after, after Khrushchev. But um, that was still an interesting article and one that was good for, I liked reading it because it really summed up like my initial thoughts um, about the Western ideas um, about Lysenko. So the main question that Lysenko is trying to answer and that, you know, evolutionary biology is trying to answer um, is what role does the environment play in evolution and how are um, traits and genes passed down? Um, and then how does that lead to s different species evolving, right? How do species change qualitatively? You know, what's the difference between one species and another? And then how do these different species emerge over time? Um, so you had... Uh, Mendel, the most famous biologist who you probably learned about in your freshman year of high school um, in biology class, and this other um, evolutionary biologist or geneticist or whatever you want to call him called Morgan, or named Morgan. Um, now I can't think of their first names. I've read too much this morning. Um, <laughs> but they basically said that uh, genetic mutation happens by accident. Right. They looked at how um, there can be or I mean, change of species and evolution happens by accident. They looked at how um, there can be mutations within a species genes. Right. And then they said they pass those mutations on to their their children, the next generation or, you know, whatever um, they're reproducing, whether this be plants um, or, or animals or whatever. But Mendel was mostly looking at plants. He was doing experiments in the garden um, at the, the monastery that he was at. 
or whatever it's called. Um, wherever priests hang out <laughs> was where he was doing his research. So then the next uh, evolution on that, you have Darwin um, that says environmental stimuli, you know, based on the or environmental stimuli cause species to change. Or no, that wouldn't be right. Sorry. He accepted the idea that genes mutate and change, right? And then he said the mutations, the, the changes that happen randomly within a species that are most well-suited to survive in the environment of that species are going to flourish because then the, you know, the um, animals who have that mutation that makes them better suited for survival um, are going to be able to re reproduce more, repopulate more, and they're going to be able to thrive compared to um, species or, or animals that don't have that or plants that don't have that. Um, so it's based on survival and it's based on environment, but it's still random, right? Um, then you have Lamarckism, which is largely what Lysenkoism is based upon, um, which says organisms themselves can adapt and change due to external stimuli. So what I originally said about Darwin, but then said, no, 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 that's not right. That's not quite what Darwin said. Lamarckism is basically that. It's that external stimuli um, can change. I mean, uh, species can change based on external stimuli, you know, based on um, what would allow them to survive and thrive. And then they can pass those changes down to the next generation, to their children. Right. So it's not just random genetic mutation that happens to be better suited to an environment. Um, but in fact, the, the subject, the species is changing um, due to the environment in real time. You know, the living organism is, can change and then pass that change down to the offspring. Um, so Lysenko took a lot of these ideas when the famines were going on in Ukraine. Um, and he was asking, you know, how can the environment be altered in order to grow more food, not only quantitatively growing, you know, more amounts of food, but also how can we change species by altering the environment um, qualitatively? You know, how do we change the species itself by altering the environment? Um, so like, for example, growing winter crops in the summer, right? How do we take a seed that would normally only grow in the winter and alter its environment or chemicals or whatever um, so that we can grow it in the summer. And, you know, he had very practical reasons for asking this, because like I said, you had the situation going on in Ukraine um, with the famines. So now, you know, what the West qu claims, you know, which is based on the false claims of far right Ukrainian nationalists back in the day, um, is that the people in Ukraine were starved on purpose. Right. Stalin starved these people on purpose because he was so evil. Stalin was just so evil. He hated Ukrainians so much that he took a giant spoon and he just ate all the food so that there was no food left for anybody else. Um, which we know that the Holodomor is BS. The famine was based on natural causes and the kulaks hoarding of grain. Um, and Stalin did everything he could to try and feed those people. Um, and this is another example, right? Lysenko was trying to figure out um, how do we use what we know about um, evolutionary biology and genetics in order to feed people. And that's why he was stationed eventually in Odessa. Um, so he could study these things directly and try and feed people. So when you read about Lysenko and what he was doing in Western, you know, biased bourgeois sources, it's, it's so distorted, right? It's based on this idea that they were like purposefully trying to starve people um, or they don't even recognize that there was an effort here to feed people. Um, and it really distorts what Lysenko was saying and what his ideas actually were. And it forces you to pick through a bunch of bullshit if you want to get to the actual core of what his theories are um, and what his research and experiments um, resulted in and, and were so that you can actually make a judgment on, on what you think of it. Right. Because they don't want you to actually do that. They don't want you to actually read it and make a judgment. They just want you to dismiss everything that came out of the Soviet Union as evil. Um, so and I'm going to read the chat chat soon. Uh, reminder for the chat. Today was my first day researching this stuff. So I, I gave a disclaimer at the start of this rant. Um, if some of you are just joining us in the middle of my Lysenko talk. I'm not um, an evolutionary biologist. I'm not a geneticist. This is the first time I've looked at, you know, evolutionary biology since like high school. Um, but I've been fascinated in the Lysenko thing. So I started doing research today. 
And these are the conclusions from my preliminary research, which is not that I'm a Lysenkoist, right? I don't know what I am. Um, I have to do a lot more reading and now I'm super interested. I'm probably going to read this stuff tomorrow if I have time. Um, but I'm not making any conclusions one way or the other, right? I'm just stating what I found today and what I think of the things that I found today um, and stating how crappy the bourgeois Western Academy is. Because if it wasn't, these ideas would be debated in public, right? They wouldn't be dismissed as conspiracy theories and thrown under the rug. Um, there's, there's so many articles, like one of the articles I read from a Western evolutionary biologist in the 70s today, I had to stop. I had to put it away because I'm like, I'm not even learning anything from this, right? They just make claims about Lysenko, like, oh, he was just trying to fit his theory into whatever Stalin wanted. And there's no evidence, not even a citation, right? It's like Lysenko did this and thought this, and it was it's all these negative things about him. No citation, no evidence whatsoever. So it's like, you know, you're just making abstract claims that are, you know, accepted as truth in the Western Academy and the Bourgeois Academy. Um, so you feel like you don't have to back them up, but then there's no evidence behind them because you feel like everyone's just going to accept these ideas, um, about Soviet union, evil, Soviet scientists, evil. So last thing I'll talk about in relation to this, a new study came out and Haas of infrared tweeted this and said, Lysenko was right, which was interesting. Um, and I'd love to hear people's take on that, but there was a new study in Israel at the University of Haifa, Haifa? I don't know how to say that. I don't speak Hebrew. Um, but this, this study challenged neo-Darwinism. It challenged the accepted genetic and evolutionary biology or the, the science of evolutionary biology in the, in the West. Because um, they found that genetic mutations in humans may not be random, right? There's a vast amount of evidence that they collected that said, in fact, People may, or, you know, species may be adapting to their external stimuli in a way that allows them to survive better and thrive, and then passing on those changes to their children, very similar to Lamarckism or Lysenkoism. Um, so the study is really interesting. Hold on, let me move my notes about the study over here. Um, so basically, they found that there um, was a malaria resistant mutation. So a lot of people were developing this genetic mutation that made them resistant to malaria um, in African communities where it was needed the most, you know, where malaria is most common. Um, and this can't be explained by neo-Darwinist theories, because if Darwin was correct, the mutation wouldn't only be isolated to these communities in Africa where malaria is really common. Right. If if neo Darwinists or Darwin were 100 percent correct, then this mutation, this uh, malaria resistant mutation would have spread ac all across Africa randomly, you know, and all across Europe by now um, because it, it helps people um, survive generally and helps species thrive. But it's not like that. It seems that these specific communities and people in these communities um, have adapted to be malaria resistant. Their genes have adapted. Um, but they haven't, it hasn't spread, you know, the way that, that you would expect it to from a Darwinist perspective. Um, so then this begs the question, was Lysenko correct um, or is Lamarckism correct? Um, so not only did they look at malaria at Haifa University, um, am I sure, do I have the study up on screen? Okay, good, good, good. Um, they collected a vast amount of data about um, genetic mutations um, and not only genetic mutations, but the environment in which these genetic mutations are coming about. And what the evidence seems to suggest is that it's not random at all, um, but that genomes, uh, but the genome collects a bunch of complex information, accumulates complex information which can respond to the environment around it and then passes that down genetically. So, you know, there's this specific community um, where there's a lot of malaria. The people in that community start to get this genetic mutation that helps them resist malaria, helps them survive. They pass that down to their children, but it remains within that community where malaria is prevalent because in their environment, malaria is prevalent, you know, but 
the genetic mutation doesn't seem to be coming about in um, in places where malaria isn't as prevalent, even within Africa, you know, the main place where you see malaria. It's only in these concentrated spots um, where malaria is hyper prevalent. So this new study and some other studies I've seen seem to challenge the neo-Darwinist theory, seem to challenge the accepted Western beliefs, the bourgeois academy's beliefs about um, evolutionary biology um, and genetics, and, you know, seems to confirm that Lysenkoism or Lamarckism or some form of them uh, was more correct than we previously thought, you know, and that the genome can, in fact, adapt to its, its environment almost in real time, which is pretty freaking incredible. Um, and yeah, it's a very dialectical materialist idea, too. The idea that the material base, the the material environment, you know, in real time changes the um, the genome and changes the the species, the subject living in that environment, um, which you know Darwin's theory does as well. Uh, but the idea that this isn't random, right? That the genome itself, you know, accumulates a complex of information and, and adapts to survive better um, would be a huge breakthrough, um, or or you know, there'd be a lot of implications for that if it was, you know, proven without a shadow of a doubt to be true. So that's all I got for now. That's where I'm at currently. My research shall continue, like I said, hopefully tomorrow. I'm deep into this now, right? I've been wanting to dive deep into it forever. And today I finally got a chance. Um, so expect more talk about this stuff. Let's see what Tom McIntyre says. Hola, Eddie. Another great stream. Humility is the first step in learning. I'm reading what is to be done again. <laughs> Lots to take in and understand. Absolutely, Tom. Thank you so much for the super chat from New Zealand. Um, love that we got comrades all around the world supporting the stream. Um, glad you're reading what is to be done. Very important text, re very relevant text. Um, you know, one of those texts, like if people ask me, what do I start with? What should I read first? What is to be done would be towards the top of the list because it gives you a plan of action. You know, what do, what do we do going forward to organize for socialism? So anything by Lenin's great, of course. Um, another great stream, humility is the first step in learning. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought that up too because, yeah, I'm not saying I know what's going on. I'm not saying I'm super immersed in the field of evolutionary biology. I'm not saying I'm a Lys Lysenko was correct. Lamarck was correct. Mendel was correct. Darwin was correct. The neo-Darwinists were correct. I don't know yet, right? What I do know is that the Western Academy, the bourgeois academy that I've been in for the last six, seven years is extremely biased. You know, it's prone to suppress information and treat uh, existing socialist countries like they're evil and nothing that ever came out of them was correct or true or smart. Um, and, you know, that this has an effect on how we view people like Lysenko, you know, and then I can also read these studies, read what Lysenko actually said versus what went Mendel or Morgan or whoever else said. Um, and, and I can analyze what I think of their claims for now with the understanding that I'm at a very early, you know, stage of understanding these things on the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, and that there's still a vast amount of information that I need to go over and analyze critically before I can come to any serious conclusions about this, um, which is, you know, the, the stance that I would tell everyone to take, because what you don't want to do is end up working backwards from your conclusions, right? Um, so no investigation, no right to speak. One of my favorite quotes. Absolutely. You should, should capture some test subject squirrels. <laughs> Bet. Oh, yeah, that's what I should start doing. I, I need to stop reading all this research from the ev evolutionary biologists and geneticists and just do my own, right? Just capture a bunch of squirrels and start doing my own tests. Try, I'm going to try and turn them into like Pokemon. Right? I'm going to be breeding squirrels like, come on, Pikachu, Pikachu, Pikachu. 